take those off. I don't know whether to have them on or take them off. Today in our lessons, we see a very important question rise kind of up out of the words. It's something that we have to grapple with day in and day out. I don't necessarily know in our day and age in which we live right here in the year 2022. I think the, the, the question is still the same, but the implications are different. And that is, what do we do with the things that get in our way of being a Christian? What do we allow from the world to distract us, to pull away from us? Uh, that 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 emphasis on God, and you know, it, it we, we've got family, we've got friends, we've got social lives, we've got vacations to go on, we've got suffering to be done, we have nurturing to do. All these things I tried to kind of include everything all together in one pile. In and of themselves, are not bad, but there's definitely a message in our lessons for today. Do we allow these things to pull us away from God? And, you know, it can be nurturing as well as celebrating that can do that. What pulls us away from God? Let's go to our first reading for today. First reading for today from 1 Kings chapter 19. There's this very famous scene here in which we see Elijah, who has been an, inc an incredibly powerful and effective prophet for the God of Israel. Uh, not trouble-free, not by any, any means. If you read the uh, story of Elijah from the Old Testament, you find out that he's in more trouble usually than not. But that does not deter him from his ministry to God and spreading the word to the people uh, in some instances, as dreadful as that word is. Here we see Elijah, and he's passing the mantle to the next generation, to Elisha. And Elisha is uh, reacting. He's responding to it. He's accepting, if you will, that, that position as being a, the prophet, of being a spokesman for God in the Old Testament way of what that means. Uh, and and uh, Elisha, Elisha says, uh, you know, I'm going to go back. I'm going to go back and take care of some business. Uh, let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. And Elisha says, go back again for what have I done to you? And that's going to be different than what happens in our gospel lesson for today. I'm going to compare the two of them, but I'm going to go to the gospel today now. We see a like situation in which you could argue that a mantle is being passed. Uh, not, not in the sense of what's happening with uh, Elijah and Elisha, but, but Jesus is walking through the crowds. He's working, walking through the Holy Land there. And he's spreading the word of God. And people are hearing it and they're being fired up by the Holy Spirit. And what do we see? We see, we'll just say there are a couple of young men, I guess. We could, we could argue that. Uh, they, they want to follow Jesus. At least that's what they say. But they have these caveats. The Lord, first let me go and bury my father. And another says, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Sounds reasonable. Why doesn't Jesus say, yeah, go ahead, kiddo, you know, just go ahead and do all these things and I'll wait here for you. You would think that that might be a logical or a reasonable thing to, to be done. But what's the difference? What's the difference between the two? The difference between the two isn't only the ministry, but the difference between the two is what the person goes back to do. Let's go back to the first reading for today. What is it that Elisha goes back and does? Elisha cuts all bonds with his past. Elisha burns the bridges. Elisha creates a situation in his life in which he cannot go back. He will only be able to follow in Elijah's footprints or footsteps. What does he do? Well, he basically goes back and he... he you want to argue it, he destroys his livelihood. He returned and following him, from following him, took the yoke of oxen, slaughtered them, all 12 of them. That was probably the entirety of his family fortune. He used the, the equipment from the oxen to do what? 
to light a fire. So he's burning the, the, the harnesses and the carts and the, the yokes, excuse me. He's burning all of that. He, and then what does he do? Is he going to sell the meat and, and have a big pack of money? No. He, he gives all the meat to the people and they eat. Elisha gives up every single thing he has. We could argue why that is, but I'm going to argue it from the perspective of what we see in the gospel today. He cuts all ties with his former past, or with his past, I guess former past is redundant, huh? <laughs> with his past, and he sets out and he follows Elijah. All right, let's go to our, let's go to our sermon for today, or I mean our, our gospel for today. In contrast to what Elijah or Elisha has just done, what are these two young men more than likely going to go do? Well, let's let's take a look at it. Uh, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. And Lord, let me first say farewell to those at my home. What does Jesus know? Why is Jesus' answer so stark? What is it that Jesus knows about human nature? What is it that Jesus knows more than likely probably about these young men, although we're not told that? And that is the incredible snare that life can become. Have you ever settled your parents' estate or had a brother or sister do so? You know, let me go back and bury my father. First of all, for this man to be worrying about his father in the sense that he's the one to bury him, that more than likely means that he's probably the firstborn. That involves property, it involves position, it involves family, it involves legal issues, and on and on and on and on. And Jesus, Jesus is just knowing that if he lets this young man go, he'll never see him again. He'll never see him again again this what's this young man going to do he's going to get caught up in the world isn't he all his attention all of what he is about is going to be faced is going to be taken up with matters of property and family issues and and jesus knows this the other the other man let me let me go back and say farewell to those at my home that sounds reasonable but what is this young man doing he's giving it away too my family's more important. My family's more important. I'm going to go back and say bye to mom and dad and my brothers and sisters. Sounds nice, but Jesus has just gotten done having an experience with his own family. Do you remember that experience with his family? Jesus is preaching to the crowds. He's preaching to the people. And some of them come to Jesus and say, hey, Jesus, you know, outside... Your mother and your brothers and your sisters are out there and they want you to go home. And what does Jesus do? Does Jesus say, well, yeah, the jig's up. Okay, we're just going to pack it in and I'm going to go home. No, what does he do? He takes that moment to present something kind of hard for us to grapple with day in and day out. Who are my mothers and my brothers and my sisters? These are my mothers and my brothers and my sisters. What does Jesus do? He expands the ministry out to include the whole world. Ministry and family, these things to Jesus are meaningless in the sense of how we may think about them and are pressured to think about them day in and day out. That doesn't mean that Jesus doesn't love his mother. He actually tells one of his disciples, right, when he's hanging on the cross, to take specially good care of his mom after he's passed on and risen from the dead. So we're not looking at a cruelty on that level. It's about ministry. It's about turning back. That's what it's about. Being tempted to go back to the old ways. And what are the old ways? Well, let's see what those are old ways are today let's go to our second reading for today paul writes to us from the letter of galatians the fifth chapter and paul doesn't mince any words in telling us what the old ways are why is it dangerous to go back why is it to allow ourselves to be turned away from the plow so to speak right jesus at the end of the gospel for today no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. And when we're talking about the kingdom of God, right, we're talking about the here and now as well as the future. 
right? There's the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is after we die, we go to heaven. The kingdom of God is not heaven. When Jesus talks about the kingdom of God, he's not talking about after we die. He's talking about now. Do we work now? Do we strive together now to create the kingdom of God? And so the kingdom of God is all times, not just after we die and go to that place in the sky as we like to envision it or imagine it. What's going on here in our second reading? Well, when we follow our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, when we live a life that is worthy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, not out of fear, because that never works, but instead out of what? For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Paul's writing it right there. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. What does Jesus know in the gospel? What does Paul know in writing the second lesson? That if we're not careful, we can allow this world to pull us back, pull us back, so that we're no longer in that state of being free and living free, but instead we can be well, we can be captive to all kinds of things, right? It can be family, it can be money, it can be health, it can be a bad attitude, it can be anger, it can be a grudge. What are some of the things that Paul lists here? Well, I don't need to read all the bad ones. You've got the list there. Let's look at verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are obvious. I don't feel like saying all those big words today. <laughs> But what I do is I will jump forward. What is it that we're called to do? What is it that Jesus knows? I'm sorry, it may sound harsh, but you've just got to drop everything and follow me. Because if you don't, you're going to get pulled down. So therefore, live this way. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. There is no law against such things. And those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. And so all these things of where there is no law against them, this is the life we are called to live under God. And that is a life of freedom, and that is a life of power. It takes a while maybe to let that sink in. I think maybe we've kind of accustomed, you know, we've grown accustomed to looking at all these things and we go, yeah, oh, that kind of makes you sound kind of weak and wimpy and sad and pitiful, doesn't it? No. Are you kidding me? If you if you truly stand in opposition to the world in the sense of of showing these kind of traits to people, you will they'll They'll perk their head up and look at you in a far different way. we got enough grumpy people in the world, right? We've got enough hateful people in the world. They are legion. We can look about us and we can, we can be pulled down in any direction. Any direction you want to you you choose or think about. What's rare? What's rare is the person that follows these ways of living. And the reason I say that's, all, that's a way of, of, of good living, but it's also a way of power, is because people are going to notice it. And they're going to wonder how you do it. And they're going to want to know what the secret is. And they're going to see in you something that they don't see anywhere else in all of the world. And that's why we can't go back. That's why we have to burn and slaughter the cattle, so to speak. Right? The, the, the things from our past that would seek to pull us back. That's why Jesus says, no, 
you know what? You, that feeling in your heart, go with it. You guys, the, you're the ones that are feeling the power of the Holy Spirit, don't allow that to be dampened by the world. And that's what Jesus knows, unfortunately, about these two young men. That they're going to go, do, they're going to go do this stuff, and then uh, you know they'll never return. Jesus will never see them again. It doesn't mean they're bad people in the sense of you know being evil people. What it means, though, is it means that they're not thinking or they don't quite understand yet what it means to be a follower of Christ, which is something that you and I are called to do every day. It's not easy. It's a challenge. It's difficult. It stands in opposition to our human nature, and it stands in opposition to the ways of the world. Congratulations, that's what it's all about. If it came natural, if it fit in with the ways of the world, then guess what? We wouldn't need to have to read a Bible, would we? It'd just be right there. Right there in our hearts and in our minds, and we wouldn't have to think or pray or ponder or hope or wonder. But instead, what is our ongoing relationship with Christ? Living as broken people sometimes, broken people, who have been broken by the past, who will be broken again in one way or another in the future, but who yet are so precious to God, precious to Jesus Christ, that he dares to go to a cross and die himself, and then rise from the dead to show us forgiven sins and hope for the future. That's what living in the kingdom of God is about. Here and now, wherever it is you are. And when I say here and now, I'm not even talking about this gathering. Although this is a wonderful and extremely important way to manifest the kingdom of God in our lives. I'm talking about when you're out on the road, when you're at the workplace, when you're with your family, wherever you may be. Just imagine if you live according to those things that Paul writes about in our second lesson for today, the effect you will have on people's lives. It's fun when people see something in you and you can tell they're curious, they want to know. What, what, what do you know that I don't know? that I'm forgiven, that I'm loved, that I've been created for a purpose, and I've been blessed with gifts to make some kind of difference in this world. When I know those things, when we know those things, we can't help but live freely. We can't help but live in a spirit of freedom. So let's go forth from here today, knowing that in our hearts and our minds that God walks with us, God goes with us. We can't turn back. Don't turn back to slavery. There's nothing there but death and pain and anguish. Instead, look to the future. Look to the future and that kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven that awaits us. All these wonderful things through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.